men and women of Voyager have been working with this spacecraft for more than a dozen years, tweaking its performance to ever greater achievements. And when you live with something over a long period of time, you tend to endow it with a personality. This is it. This is an exact replica of the Voyager spacecraft. As you can see, it would fill a good-sized living room, except when it's launched, all of these booms and projections are folded up to fit inside the rocket, and then into planetary space, they open up. Voyager is a fairly intelligent robot. It has an onboard computer that's constantly being reprogrammed by commands from Earth, but it knows to do a lot of things by itself, and it also knows if it gets into trouble, to call home for help. The whole spacecraft is powered by this thing, a radioactive power source contains plutonium. The plutonium decays, makes heat. The heat is converted into electricity, and the electricity powers everything else. In here are the electronics, the onboard computers, the tape recorder. All of the instructions that the spacecraft receives come in through this great dish-shaped antenna, and all of the data that it acquires is radioed back to Earth through the same antenna. Over here is a uh, kind of very elaborate license plate that we'll talk about later. These are two of a number of hydrazine thrusters. They uh, uh, are tiny rockets that can reorient the spacecraft to uh, uh, make precision photography possible, for example. Here is a uh, boom on which there are many science instruments. This is... Uh, the scan platform. A lot of the major instruments are, are on it, and uh, it can move. Let me see if I can make it move. It can move in various directions, so it's what permits the spacecraft to take a picture of that world and then take a picture of that world. These are the two cameras that have been responsible for the tens of thousands of magnificent pictures that Voyager has returned from Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Voyager was pelted with debris as it went through the outer fringes of planetary rings. It ran the risk of being fried by planetary radiation belts. It's on its backup receiver. There was a time when its scan platform got dangerously stuck. There's so little light at Uranus and Neptune that Voyager, designed to work closer to the sun, ran the risk of returning pictures that were too dark or too blurry. And yet, because of the human intelligence of its controllers back here on Earth at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and because of the robotic intelligence in the spacecraft, Voyager flies on. Our eyes and ears and a dozen other senses that we weren't born with, acting in our stead in a realm of the solar system too distant and too dangerous for us personally to travel to, at least yet. And Voyager is also, with its golden phonograph record, our emissary to the stars. I feel elated about it. It's, uh, it's like watching a child that you gave birth to to grow up and mature and suddenly solve some of the major problems of the world. And it makes you feel uh, very proud and wonderful. Voyager's become an elderly relative. The cameras are failing in health. They'll make it through this encounter, but uh, they probably wouldn't make it through another one. And that's sort of like having an elderly relative that you're caring about and watching fail and feeling kind of bad about. Anytime Voyager aches, I ache. When we see little hiccups and we have to figure out ways of sending a small amount of medication to the spacecraft, uh, it's fun to be able to do that in a way that the spacecraft continues to operate as it should. Well, imagine this machine. Each Voyager has the equivalent of 5 million electronic parts. Now, that's equivalent to about 2,000 color Sony television sets. Can you imagine expecting 2,000 television sets to perform for 12 years? No, it's, it's, it's gone, uh, I think, beyond the call of duty.